All right, welcome everyone for the uh, to the December 2015 meeting of the uh, Ottawa RASC. My, my pleasure to uh, host my final meeting as meeting chair. I'm really excited about this uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, we've got, as you've seen when you walked in, lots of exhibitors, and I'm very, very um, pleased that everyone um, everyone um, was kind enough to share their time and uh, and their and their Friday evening here. So, a bit of a different meeting here. Uh, um, so the first part of the meeting is about, about our elections, about our state, uh, about the year in review, and that's procedural stuff that we have to do. We are a uh, charitable, or, uh, a nonprofit organization, and a corp fairly corporate organization, and we must do this. <coughs> My plan is to go through this fairly quickly here. There's also opportunities for questions, and um, so I'm I encourage members to uh, participate in that discussion. Um, as always, we have some um, observation reports, and then the second, I'm hoping that a little bit more than the second half, a little more than half of the meeting, we spend without any presentations where we can uh, walk around and look at the exhibits and have a, a, um, a more of an interactive uh, collaborative session. So a different kind of meeting, but uh, one that I, I hope you'll enjoy. Um, there is refreshments as well, like courtesy of our, um, our, our art and end. And, uh, that will be the format of the meeting. So let's get right to it. Well, let's get right to it. A couple of announcements uh, first before we started. So to date, all the way up to the end of November, we had 55 uh, new members, um, which includes uh, two new mem two new members, Richard Allen and John Hanley. Richard and John, are you, are you here tonight? Say yes if you are. Okay. <laughs> I think you're here. You're watching on the internet. I'm going to take. I'm going to go with that. Uh, but. Um, I just wanted to say, when I reflect back on this, we're better as a group because of our because of our mem because of our new members. So uh, I sincerely welcome you, and, and uh, I encourage you to to uh, participate and volunteer in our organization because I think that's what makes it uh, that's what makes it that much more enjoyable when we um, we can benefit from all your the skills and talents that, that join the organization. Uh, members in the news, there was something very uh, interesting from um, uh, Mary Brown. So so Mary is who is an Ottawa Centre member. Uh, she uh, photographed an image that appeared, uh, a photo that appeared in uh, Sky News, and that is the, uh, um, boy, the lights are just a little bright here tonight. Um, the, uh, the sun uh, halo, and uh, a sun, sun halo with sun dogs, and uh, it, it, this is in the, uh, just recently received, the uh, um, January 2016, I guess, uh, Sky News magazine, and uh, it's quite something that uh, she was able to do this uh, um, it's, it's one of those fortunate uh, photos that we would all like to, uh, to, uh, um, to, to take. Mike, go one slide. Go one slide? Okay. One more. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so, okay, now, um, what we're talking about this last night as we're preparing for the meeting. Uh, does anyone know what this is called up here? A little bit louder? Circumzenith Arc, and, and what is the what is the reason for that? What is the phenomenon of that? Ice crystals. Yeah, but I mean, why in that shape? <laughs> ice crystals. <laughs> okay. It very. Uh, she was at the right time, at the right moment, in the right time, and uh, right place, I guess. Um, she so, told me about this slide that she uh, got an urgent emergency call from her husband. Stop everything you're doing, find your camera, get outside, <laughs> grab it. <laughs> and she did. Um, one, other, one other, I'll just quickly go for that. Okay. One other announcement of members in the news that just popped up. Back on November 11th, uh, Simon uh, Hamner uh, gave a, a, a talk to the um, Ottawa Field Naturalist uh, uh, group. And he gave a talk. Uh, his talk was, um, is our solar system and planet Earth within it? Normal, but what was really nice about Simon's talk is there were a couple of things. Simon told me that it was one of the one of the most enjoyable talks he's given um, ever. The group he he spoke for 50 minutes and he had and it was followed by he said 50 minutes of, of questions. But what's really nice to see here is a lovely thank you card that uh, that he got from uh, signed by everyone in attendance with some really um, thoughtful words. So Simon, you do your usual your usual uh, amazing uh, delivery and. Uh, and, and only the way that you can do it. So well done, Simon. Thanks for that. I, I hear through the grapevine that Simon's going to be presenting in January again, but uh, that's the next meeting, sure. Okay, let's go to the um, to Gordon uh, Webster, who's going to uh, talk about the um, 
the uh, our general meeting and announcements and so forth. No. Oh, I can. So, Gordon, over to you. The right button advances. Right button. Right button. Thank you, Mike. Okay, let's see if we can figure this out. So, first thing we have to do is uh, approve the minutes of the last meeting. Okay, can I have a move to the next slide? Move, move to the uh, move to the next slide. Give me the beeper. Lots of advancing here. Okay, good. <laughs> These minutes were circulated to everyone with notice for the meeting, so you should all have read them thoroughly and studied them. <laughs> Okay, so we need a motion to. Okay. Oscar. Uh, seconder, yeah. Oscar. 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 Those in favor? Opposed? Next. Okay. So the president's report. Okay, you should all have a copy of this, and I'm going to bore you by reading it to you. <coughs> if I can see it. So this year is rapidly uh, coming to an end and we find ourselves once again at the AGM. This is uh, sometimes tedious but always necessary part of our process as a not-for-profit organization. It's also an opportunity for you to step forward to help guide your, our center. And this is what your new council has done. And we hope that uh, a lot of you will do that in the future. In many ways, uh, 2015 has been an amazing year for the Ottawa Center, thanks to Mike Mogadam. We have had some outstanding speakers at our monthly meetings, uh, both from inside and outside our center. <clears throat> We've had outstanding response to our CARP star parties with attendance of about uh, 350 to 400 people at each event. And on top of that, we only missed one star party due to weather. Um, our lunar eclipse event was equally successful, equally well attended with similar numbers. Our membership is up, as Mike just mentioned, and it's likely as a result of these, these events and our monthly meetings. Uh, Art and Ann Fraser uh, make sure that we always have refreshments at the meeting, and Art is our membership expert. Uh, we've received a donation of an 18-inch Star Master, and we're planning to build a new observatory uh, to house it, and another scope that we have out at the FLO. And in the meantime, Ron St. Martin continues to make sure that the grass is cut and the laneway is plowed in the winter and that the 16 inch we have there now is maintained. Uh, the, start, the smart scope, which we've been working on for many, 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 many years now, is finally in its final test stages uh, before it will be made available to the membership. Uh, Jim will be giving a report shortly on that, but he, he and his team assure me that it will be fully functional before spring. Uh, thanks to all of those involved in that project. Uh, Mike Mogadam's uh, telescope clinics were back this year and just as popular as before. Members and others were able to get help with issues that they were having with their telescopes, their mounts, with collimation, <clears throat> or whatever it was they needed. Uh, using social media, the Ottawa Centre continues to reach hundreds of people via our, via our website, uh, Facebook, and Meetup. Our webmaster, Chuck Riddell, deserves a special thank you for his efforts in updating our, our website. I know it was a real challenge for Chuck, but he's done a great job. <clears throat> Eric and Eunice uh, Kajoa continue to provide us with video recordings of every meeting and to stream our monthly meetings live over the internet. Thank you both. <laughs> yeah, we've lost the page. Okay, every month our librarian, uh, Estelle Rotian, has a new a recommendation from our book library. Al Scott continues to look after the telescope loan library. And we have a new magazine subscription coordinator, uh, Stuart Glenn. Karen Finstadt, as editor of Astronauts, has done a wonderful job this year. And Janet Tullock has returned as assistant editor, so we can look forward to even more in the coming year. Our finances are kept in order by a very capable uh, Oscar. Thank you to all of you. Our, uh, the annual dinner a couple of weeks ago was a really good success. I hope, well, I know, I know a lot of you were there. Thanks to our Vice President, uh, Tim Cole. 
We had 65 people in attendance uh, who were treated to a wonderful presentation on robotics in space and the Canadarm2 by a delightful rising star in the Canadian space industry, uh, Kristen Facchio. This was also the last chance you had to enjoy the culinary treats prepared under the guidance of our host for the past 11 years, Gordon Esnard, who, as yet unbeknownst to his employer, is retiring in a few weeks. The uh, Paul Commission Observer of the Year Award went to Paul Klinginger. Uh, once again this year, that makes two years in a row for him. Uh, best Astronauts article went to Barry Matthews. I think Barry has a display here tonight. And best presentation went to Al Scott. Yes, definitely. I'd also like to thank Bill Wagstaff and Rick Wagner for serving as our national uh, council representatives for the past two years and for all they've done in the past. I'm sure that they'll continue to, con to contribute. As well, I want to thank all of those on council for all the hard work over the past year. You're the ones who keep this group running and worth belonging to. We owe you all our thanks. One person. One person who deserves our special thanks is Chris Tarrant. Chris has been doing what he does for our center for as long as I've been coming to these meetings. Chris makes sure that everything happens and makes it seem effortless. Chris is here an hour before every meeting and usually is the last to leave. He sometimes spends hours correcting problems the rest of us haven't even noticed. When we arrived at this location, there were numerous issues with the audiovisual system. And he spent a lot of hours working to resolve it. I don't know where we would be without Chris, but I'm not anxious to find out. So thank you, Chris. So I don't know about you, but I see a pattern in, in all of the things I've mentioned above. People volunteering their time and talents to ensure that the rest of us don't have to do anything but show up and enjoy the meetings and, and everything that the Ottawa Centre has to offer. If you're a new member, or even if you're someone who's never been here, or sorry, if, even if you're someone who's been here for a long time, I can think of no better way of enhancing your RSC experience than to get involved. It doesn't have to be a large time commitment, help with a star party, you know, share an observation of the meeting with the observation reports, write a book review for astronauts. It's a cliche, but it's true you get more out of volunteering than you ever put in. Finally, I'd like to thank you for having me as your president. I'm looking forward to the next year. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna call on Oscar for his uh, treasurer's report. Thank you, Gordon. All right, so we're going to talk uh, numbers here a little bit uh, quickly. Uh, so we got our auditor's report from uh, Dave Parfait, who we nominated last year as our auditor, and he gave us a clean, a clean review of our financials for the 2013-2014 uh, year. Uh, so I'm going to start with the income statement. We had revenues of $13,222, uh, cost of goods sold of uh, $1,200, Operating costs of $11,905, which gave us a net total loss of $16. Um, $1,722 of that, which was uh, depreciation, so total net uh, cash income of $1,706. Uh, so for our balance sheet, uh, we have current assets of $50,299, capital assets of uh, $10,700, total assets $61,000, Total current liabilities of $39, uh, with retained earnings from the previous fiscal of uh, $60,995, uh, and total liabilities and equity of $61,000. Oh, yeah, just need to go to my notes here, sorry. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned in the income statement, we had, uh, we had a total loss of $16. Um, but in reality, we had a gain of $1,700 in cash. Uh, we had to depreciate some, some capital assets. 
Uh, next one, please. Uh, we have uh, $30,000 in investments in GICs, and we, we gained about $600 in interest uh, from that. Um, FLO continues to cover a large part of its operational expenses through the through the user fees that we charge. Um, and this year we had 17 key holders, uh, so we collected about $600, and that covered about, we had about $1,000 total expenses at FLO, so we, we did cover some of it, but most of it is covered through the, uh, through the fees. Um, we spent uh, $314 in, in new and repaired equipment at uh, SmartScope this year, um, and as, uh, as Jim will report later, um, that's making uh, good progress there. Uh, we received $103 in charitable donations uh, from our membership, so I'd, I'd like to thank everyone who, who was able to donate to the Centre, that, uh, that really helps out our, our financials, thank you very much. In addition to that, <laughs> sorry, uh, in addition to that we had $301 donated to us through, uh, through United Way directed donations as well as, as other sources, so to anyone that directs their United Way um, monies to us, thank you very much. Uh, so membership revenue was up about 10% year over year, um, although our donations significant, were significantly reduced uh, over the previous year, overall our revenue was up about 1%. Our operating expenses uh, were up this year. A large part of that was, um, was some of the, the public speakers that we brought in, but, but that's all covered through the public speaking program by, by National, so that sort of balances itself out. Um, so given that our revenue and expenses uh, are, were balanced this year and they, they continue to, to, do, uh, to be so, then uh, I, I can say that our, center, um, that our center remains financially viable. Uh, so as I mentioned, David Parfait has audited or reviewed our, our financials from the previous fiscal year and gave us a clean review. Um, and in addition to that, he has agreed to accept uh, a nomination um, to, to review our, our next year's financials. Uh, so does anyone have any questions about the financials? Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I uh, need a motion to approve the financial statements as presented. Uh, I guess Paul there has a... And a seconder, Janet. Janet. Okay, so Paul and Janet. And uh, all in favor? All right, motion carried. All right, so we'd like to, uh, I'd like to nominate David Parfait as our, as our auditor for the, uh, for 2014-2015. Uh, <laughs> So I'll need a motion to appoint uh, David Parfait as our auditor. Steve. And a seconder. Okay, all in favor? All right, motion carried. All right, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, so now uh, Jim, go ahead. You come up. Oh, there you are. Here he comes, Jim Maxwell. You'd be pleased to know you don't have to vote on anything in this thing. A couple of things I should point out. First, uh, SmartScope was built as a millennium project, and the work was completed around 2000. Then it fell into disuse, and about five years ago, after a, the, the um, the slider on the front of the dome broke off. We went back out and we've been at it for five years. Uh, and I'm pleased to know from presidential decree <laughs> that we're going to be all finished uh, this year. However, let's just see. My glasses on here. Behind me are pictures from SmartScope over the past season taken by Paul Conninger. Uh, Wolf Lencher and I supervised him to the point of sitting back in awe as he worked his magic. For the new members, uh, SmartScope is a club-owned 16-inch F10 schmidt Cascreen uh, Mead telescope that's uh, mounted on a remotely operated Paramount GT 1100 mount. 
It's uh, located at the um, Communications Research Center campus facility on Carling Avenue. Astrophotography is not easy at SmartScope and has been impacted this, this year by SmartScope's inability to successfully target and image designated objects. In effect, SmartScope was a go-to computer that didn't know where to go. Our goal this past year was to correct that situation. In early spring, Wolf and Paul spent some time rewiring uh, Paul's DSLR he had loaned to us in order to, keep, in order to take the deep sky pictures beyond the 30 second limit built into the camera. Remember the camera is mounted on the scope in the dome room while the shutter is activated electronically by computer in the warm room. Wolf built a homemade wiring harness and saved the expense of sourcing a ready-made system so we can now hold the shutter open remotely for any length of time. Paul also took the initiative to impact a long overdue recollimation of the scope. We expect this will not be an ongoing, we expect this will be an ongoing practice, giving temperature fluctuations over time. And the spiders were not happy. Then we found that the existing finder scope had such a large field of view that the main scope with its small field of view couldn't target finder scope objects. As a result, we had to resort to removing the, the uh, Mead's main camera and setting up the tube in hope of seeing reflected light sourced by a naked eye. Bright objects such as Sirius were essential. Unfortunately, once we had an object, the computer wouldn't start the alignment process for reasons explained later. A partial solution came in the purchase of a uh, C70 spot spotting scope with its smaller and more compatible field of view that we used to complement the existing finder scope. However, in the process of mounting the new finder scope, the motor drives that rotate the dome broke. As an aside, I should mention that it is both interesting and unpleasant trying to manually rotate a 10-foot fiberglass dome by hand in the dark and the cold. <coughs> the two drive motors that rotate the dome are not available on the open market and are only sold to manufacturers of other objects, such as the drive set sold by Home Dome, the original supplier of the SmartScope dome, at a cost of approximately $700 US. I made several attempts to find individual motors, including a request at one of our monthly meetings. Um, finally, after talks with Wolf and St uh, Stephen Norse, Stephen is one of our local MacGyvers, I visited a junkyard at the east end of Ottawa and bought two used wiper motors. They didn't work out either. <clears throat> but anyone interested in two good used wiper motors Assemblies for a 2000 Chevy Impala should talk to me later. <laughs> Over the summer, Stephen found replacement motors. He isn't saying where he found them, and I'm not asking. By September, we were ready to go. We also recruited a new recruited, okay, recruited a new volunteer in September, Eric LeMay, to assist in the next part of our solution to the imaging problem, the calibration training of the computer so that it will remember and accurately point to designated objects by using Maximum DL's MaxPoint software. MaxPoint looks at multiple points in the sky and calculates the variance between where the scope is pointing and where it thinks it's pointing. The more points looked at, the better the pointing accuracy. As I said before, <clears throat> astrophotography is not easy at SmartScope. During the calibration attempt, we found the reason why the computer would not accurately point to objects from the uh, alignment exercise, the mounted lost polar alignment. Apparently, all those years uh, with adding and taking pieces off it had had its effect. You cannot do accurate pointing without accurate polar alignment. We had planned, <coughs> this is, I wanted to do that. As an aside, we had planned last week to go out and do the polar line with a smart scope, but canceled the last minute because of the overcast clouds in the um, east end. I did phone some people in the west end to ask how they were making out, and they said no, it was overcast there too. So we canceled the meeting, and a half hour later, the sky's clear. <laughs> As for the future, <clears throat> well, first we're going to fix the polar alignment. Once the scope and the mounts are properly aligned, we should be able to construct an accurate pointing model of the sky then 
at long last, we can begin the process of remote operation and imaging over the internet. I can hardly wait for the next surprise. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hopefully the last surprise will be that microphone attacking you. Okay, uh, awards. I'd like to call on uh, Mike and Karen to come up and do the presentation of the award. Okay, folks, I guess the, um, you've heard earlier, and for those of you who attended the, um, the, uh, the, uh, our annual uh, uh, dinner meeting, you know that um, the Observer of the Air went to, uh, I think it was no surprise, we were, we were blessed to see many of his images throughout the air and his, and his wonderful uh, descriptions of, the, um, uh, of his images uh, taken over many nights, probably many cold nights, but uh, we, it's my uh, pleasure to award the Observer of the Paul Commission, Observer of the Air, to uh, Paul Clowinger. Paul, can you come up, please? Thank you, Mike. Thanks again, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Next slide. All right, the presentation of the year award goes to, um, boy, I, uh, I announced it again at the, at the dinner meeting, but I've changed my mind. I think it should go 20 ways. So I'm going to take this award and I'm going to break it into 20 pieces and give it to, give it to, uh, to each of the, uh, the 20 uh, wonderful presenters. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that. But we're really hung up on this best of, which kind of bothers me, because there's so many outstanding uh, presenters and outstanding uh, imagers in our, in, our, in our club that uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's hard to pick one. Um, there is one, though, that I think I, I deserve special uh, note, and that is to, next slide, Chris, is to Al Scott. He delivered a presentation in, uh, in May uh, 2015, um, Observational Cosmology, and for those of you who remember it, it was a, um, it was a, a, a account on the our, our evolving understanding of the uh, of, of of the universe, and Al, um, I, you know, Al thoroughly researched that over many months, and he delivered it with the um, with is 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 you know with flawlessly, and and uh, I, I thought it was uh, something very very special, and I have a lot of a lot of uh, respect for Al. I know Al can't be here tonight, but uh, I called him the other day, and and he was. Uh, he was uh, really happy to receive this and, and pretty humble as well. So, Al, um, if you're watching uh, somewhere, uh, congratulations. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking everyone who uh, responded positively to being pestered for contributions to astronauts and uh, the pestering will continue. Um, I was able to pester Barry Matthews in person uh, after uh, hearing him give a presentation on his uh, miniature telescopes at the General Assembly in Halifax. And when I approached him afterwards, I'm sure he thought he was all finished with it, but he very generously uh, handed over all the uh, materials and, uh, and photographs. And he's here tonight with his wonderful little gems. I urge you all to go have a I look at them, and I'm very pleased to be presenting Barry Matthews with the uh, Best Article of the Year Award for 2015. Thank you very much, Barry. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Well, congratulations to all our winners. Okay, so now the main event elections. And as it turns out, everyone's acclaimed. <laughs> so that was mostly painless. Okay, so we have a few outgoing people. I mentioned two of them, uh, Bill Wagstaff and Rick Wagner, who served on Cap um, as our national reps. I uh, want to thank them once again. They've done a wonderful job. We've got one other outgoing person, and I haven't prepared anything because I don't have that much paper at home to print stuff out, a list of things we should be recognizing and saying about him. You all know over the past two years how, how wonderful the selection speakers and the, and the meetings, the presentations have been, and, and there's only one person to blame it on, and that's Mike. 
Um, thank you very much, Mike, for everything you've done over the past two years. It's been marvelous, and you're going to be missed. Thank you. So that said, we have a couple of new people coming on. Uh, for count national representatives, we've got uh, Rob Dick, thank you Rob, and Brian McCullough. So a round of applause for those two. And taking over from Mike, I'm gonna massacre his last name, Roman Zioba. Zioba. So welcome Roman. Okay, and then we have the appointed positions. So there again, uh, there are no changes here. Uh, we have Estelle at the library. We have Chuck uh, as our webmaster. Karen is staying on as editor. Uh, Ron at the FLO. Jim with the smart scope. Light pollution and public outreach are, are Gary Boyle. Uh, Art and Ann Fraser for hospitality. Al for the, the uh, telescope lo loan library and Art Fraser again, that membership, and thank you to all of you. And Al is looking for someone to assist with the library. You may have noticed that position was open as well. Okay, so any other business? Does anybody have anything they wanted to bring up or discuss? I can't see past that light, so if your hand's up, just shout out. Questions? Any questions? No, nope, we're good. Okay, so I call for an adjournment. Uh, Eve, are you here? <laughs> Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Great, thank you. Okay, I'll turn things back over to Mike. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, well, back to our uh, regular scheduled programs. Um, we're going to do some observation reports. We, okay, um, so f we got uh, Pierre, Joe, Eric, and Paul. Let's do them uh, back to back. So first up um, is uh, Pierre Martin. Pierre? I know you're here. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Mike. Can we turn all the lights down, please? So back in uh, October, I did a presentation about uh, meteor showers and the torrids in particular. It's one of the lesser known annual meteor showers, uh, more because it uh, produces only a very small number of meteors over the span of uh, a few weeks. Uh, but every once in a while, every few years, it's one shower that tends to produce a large proportion of fireballs. And there were predictions that uh, this year would be uh, one of the uh, good years based on uh, modeling of the stream and where the Earth would be positioned amongst the, uh, the larger concentration of uh, particles within the torrid streams. So as it, as it turns out, uh, the predictions that came true from the period of uh, late October up until about mid-November, there were reports from all over the world coming in of uh, people spotting uh, really bright uh, fireballs uh, and up to minus tens or more. And I, I was a bit aggravated because I really wanted to get out uh, during the last new moon in November. And I caught a, a bad case of the flu, so I uh, managed to get out only one night, November, the evening of November 9th, which was a beautiful evening. And there was a few other clear nights around that time, so uh, I had heard that people were still watching some uh, really good torrid, uh, torrid activity. So I went out to a dark site out past Arnprior, and uh, the, uh, this is one uh, meter that I caught. Lights off, please, Chris. Yeah, if we can uh, turn out the uh, lights, that would be uh, great, just to get the, the best uh, contrast. So the, uh, this meter actually did not see. The Thank you. I had my camera pointed over towards the, uh, the western sky, and I was actually doing my observation facing south, so I, I never saw that meteor. Uh, but um, a friend of mine who's an Ottawa Centre member, uh, Shane Finnegan, he was out and he happened to be walking and looking out west and he saw the meter go, uh, drop down and then he said, Pierre, you got that meter, it's in your camera. And he said, uh, really, was it a bright one? He said, oh yeah, it was bright, it was minus four or minus five, uh, like really bright and it's in your camera, guaranteed. And, 
and uh, it turned out that I did catch it. And I did, and this was definitely a uh, torrid. So just a uh, roughly about 20 seconds later or so, there was another torrid. This one was a minus two, same part of the uh, sky. And again, this is uh, just a simple setup. My my uh, DSLR mounted on a, on a fixed uh, tripod, no uh, uh, no tracking, just always on the same part of the sky. So the next uh, shot, what I did, because what I noticed is these two meteors actually left uh, persistent trains. So they it left a debris train that uh, actually um, lasted for several uh, minutes over the span of the uh, exposures that I was taking continuously with the camera. So the uh, if we can uh, start the uh, the video there, uh, Chris, that would be great. So and uh, if you can just put it on the uh, on a loop. And what you'll notice is the uh, right at the beginning you see the uh, the first uh, bright meteor and the and you see the train drifting towards the right side. And then uh, pay close attention as the video starts over and look on, on the left side, you see the other train that drifts uh, uh, down into the uh, other direction. So it starts about here and then the other one is, is over here. Maybe one more time just to have a look. So the uh, span of time you have is about 20 minutes and the two meteors probably occurred uh, about 20 seconds of each other. Just a pure look that it happened this way that the camera caught it, uh, the, the two uh, bright meteors, which uh, both are torrids. And that's it. And just before I go, I just want a, a quick reminder, the uh, Gemini meteor shower peaks next uh, week on the evening of uh, December 13th. Uh, do try to make a good point of uh, getting out to see them because it's, uh, it's often considered the best shower of the year. And it's uh, also a good year. It's a new moon condition, so uh, ideal conditions. Unfortunately, the peak time is in the daytime of the 13th. I mean the, the, the 14th. So that means that the, the, best, the two best nights are probably going to be the evening of the 13th and the night after that. Uh, it's a broad activity shower, so the, uh, even if we're not in the right place in the world to see the main maximum, we can still see some good activity over the course of uh, two or three nights. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Hi, so uh, this one is, uh, of course, uh, Star Trails. This is my first attempt at Star Trails, and uh, I have to take my hat off to uh, Pierre for his meteor shots, because the original intent of the shot, this is actually taken on the night of the person maximum, and when I uh, realized in post-processing how difficult it is to get the meteors to pop out in a composite image, uh, I decided I'd throw the subs into Star Stacks instead and see what I got, and, uh, and this is what I got. This was taken at a... Uh, at, in uh, Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. I was in the summer vacation at the time, just near the beach. And uh, luckily I caught, uh, I caught this before the, the fog rolled in off the water. But you can see uh, up near Polaris there, uh, what I, after I ran the stack the first time, I was excited that, oh, I did get a nice bright meteor, but that's actually the uh, International Space Station. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, you can see actually uh, the, uh, the shutter speed of my camera because you can see there's actually two breaks in the in the uh, in the line that was kind of indicates the uh, uh, how fast it's going and that just a, a camera shutter it, it travels that far. Okay, uh, next one, please. So uh, this is the the Milky Way near uh, uh, near Cygnus, and uh, this is done on a fixed tripod. Uh, forget the number. So this is actually uh, four subs of five minutes each at ISO 800 using a, a Canon 550D or a T2I. Uh, that took this one out uh, at uh, Lac Camel in, in Quebec, which is uh, but near Gracefield on the way to Manawaki. So it was nice and dark up there, uh, except for the cottage lights that are around, but uh, uh, it's amazing what you can do with, uh, with black loblaws bags to mask under the cottage lighting. But uh, we got a fair number of uh, interesting objects in there, so there's the, uh, oh, which button is the, the right. pointer? The right, thank you. Oh. Left, go back. <laughs> <laughs> the other right, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let's try this one. There we go. So uh, uh, this is a North American nebula, and uh, the Pelican Nebula didn't quite pop out nearly as well. Uh, we've got, uh, of course, uh, Andromeda Galaxy M31 down here, and a number of clusters. And I didn't bring my map with me, but I think we have M. Is that 29 or 39? Is in this area, or actually maybe that's it there. 
and uh, the uh, uh, gamma Cygni complex is here. So all sorts of uh, nebulism cluster or in, in this in this image. Do you have the dark nebula there? Just above the the G3, right in the middle, above NGC center. Above North America, the dark Oh, right here. What's that called again, sir? Oh, I'm gonna look that one up. And that's my last image. This is, uh, of course, uh, Messier 45. Uh, fairly bright object to the naked eye, but it's uh, great what the uh, the camera can pull out that you can't see at the eyepiece. Uh, this is uh, 49, 45 second subs at ISO 1600. Uh, did this through uh, an Orion ED80, 80, 80 millimeter refractor. It's a uh, 600 millimeter focal length. And I had that mounted on an uh, Ioptron ZAQ 25. So I managed to get about, uh, it's not guided, so I got about 45 second subs uh, before the tracking let me down. But uh, uh, all in all, I could pull them pretty well. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I decided to uh, head up the tables again. This time I went with Paul Cloninger and, uh, and Terrace as well too. And uh, halfway through the night, I decided I was going to take my, uh, my camera down across the field and image this, uh, this tree. From across the field, it, it looked kind of spooky and a little weird shaped. So it, it sort of drew me in to try to light it up. Uh, it took Terrace and I about half an hour to actually uh, position the camera. Um, it's, it, this shot is taken with a 14 millimeter fisheye lens, so I was about a foot off the ground, and if you moved it about a foot either way, the tree kind of took on a different shape, so it's it a little difficult to, uh, uh, to get this. But um, as you'll see later on, I have a time lapse where this will actually come to life. Um, if you can, where's uh, the thing here? So, oh, no. Yeah. So if you notice up here, you've got uh, Orion in this uh, in this area right here. You've got Orion's sword, or sorry, Orion's belt and Orion's sword right here. If we could have the next image, this is a close-up shot of that area. So back up on on the hill, I uh, I took my 135 millimeter uh, telephoto lens and uh, used my Canon T2i to to grab this shot. It's a total exposure of about 88 um, 88 minutes. And uh, so what we have down here, we've got the Flame Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula, the Running Man Nebula, and the Great Orion Nebula, otherwise known as uh, Messier number 42. And one thing that struck me about this image was the fact that uh, in this region all around in here, I was able to pull out some of, the, uh, some of the dust and debris that's in that area. And so at the same time, my actual mission for that night was to image um, the, uh, the Orion Nebula. So if we could have the next shot, I took this with my telescope, and so you can see a bit more of the uh, the dust and, and debris around um, Orion. This is actually a high dynamic range uh, image where I, I took multiple uh, images at different lengths of exposure and put them back together on the computer so that I could uh, I can attempt to get the uh, the core right in here. It's really bright. What I found though, if you take uh, exposures that are too short. Um, at the core, it it becomes really, really flat. You kind of lose uh, any kind of depth that you see otherwise uh, caused by the, the core sort of being blown out. So in any case, I'm, I'm planning on imaging this more this winter with uh, narrow band images, and I'm going to attempt to get more of the, uh, the dust lines uh, to pop out of this one. So if I could have the next one here now. Uh, I decided to do a bit of an end of the year um, video of all the time lapse I've shown this year. Um, I figured uh, for those people who have not seen some of the time lapse I've done throughout the year, uh, they might get a chance to see some of them in this. Plus I have uh, a few new shots as well too uh, at the end of this, namely the one with the tree. And after last uh, month's meeting, uh, Paul and I both uh, booked it out to uh, Silver Lake after uh, Mike Banks had said, hey, the auroral oval is hot again. So 
there we saw another sunrise and got another time lapse out of that. So if we could play that, please. It's fair to say our center has talent. Um, obviously, we have one more presenter. It's uh, Paul Clowinger. Um, Paul, uh, it's going to be really tough to do three <laughs> times in a row. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's right. When you're out late at night with me, you want to be uh, <laughs> Paul. Thank you, sir. That was, that was an awesome piece of work, Eric. That's uh, that's beautifully done. Nice choice of soundtrack too. Really, uh, very fitting there. But uh, very nice piece of work. So, uh, as Eric mentioned, after last meeting, we were enjoying a, a, an ale at, at Grace O'Malley's there and, and chatting with everybody. And Mike whips out his phone and says, Look, Aurora Oval, KP7. So, Eric and I just kind of looked at, it and said, at each other and said, Let's go. <laughs> so, we kind of packed up, headed out to my place, grabbed our equipment, and drove out to Silver Lake, which is along Highway 7. And, uh, uh, managed to get there just in time. The, the aurora was already starting to wind down a bit, but we did uh, we did get a, a nice view of it uh, for for uh, at least about half an hour or so, and uh, that was certainly part of uh, Eric, Eric's uh, time lapse. And uh, and I managed to uh, to shoot uh, the the this still. I, I I've uh, put together a time lapse as well for it, and uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a quite nice uh, it was quite nice display. Um, 
it's a very dark side up uh, out at Silver Lake, and so it was. Uh, what we did see was rather nice, and we had the clouds moving through there, which uh, would add, which added a certainly a, a nice effect there. Um, so let's see if we uh, where we are we at there. So can you roll that one? This is my short animation. Uh, not no dramatic soundtrack on this one, but you'll, you'll get the idea. So we got there just in time. You can see the the lake at the bottom there. Got it just in time to. to to watch the auroras dance and, and watch some clouds move in mid and it kind of started winding down on us a bit. So, but it was worth the drive out there. It was uh, it was just a, a pleasant night there. No snow on the ground yet either. You can just see it kind of get getting nice and quiet there. So then we just concentrated on on time lapses of the uh, of the sky itself. There we had some very bright satellites move through here. You'll see a couple in a, in, a, in a moment here. One we thought was the ISS, that one, but it wasn't the ISS, we don't know what that was. So we stayed out for there for a couple of hours and, uh, and, uh, and got some good imaging down there. All right. And Pierre, you're, you're absolutely right about the Torrids. Uh, uh, about a week after that aurora, uh, Terrace, as, as Eric mentioned, Terrace, Eric, and myself were up at Teeple Hill. For those of you that aren't familiar with that site, it's out near Griffith, a uh, very, very dark uh, area in the, in the Madawaska Highlands there, and uh, about a 400 meter elevation. So we set up our, our equipment there, and uh, uh, I was also shooting uh, time-lapse stuff there. I haven't got a time-lapse for that today, but uh, this is a single shot there, and uh, uh, again, that's a torrid meteor that came through. I saw several that night there, and certainly during, during uh, uh, the latter half of October and, and early, uh, November, as Pierre said, it was quite active. I was surprised. Pretty much every time I went out, uh, I could see uh, I could see a, a number of these torrents, and they tended to be quite bright, which uh, which people had been talking about uh, that that being a possibility. So they didn't let us down. It was a, it was a really nice shower there, and uh, that was one of the brighter ones I caught that night up on Teeple Hill, along with the uh, the uh, the Milky Way there. Obviously, the, there's the North American Nebula, and the Milky Way is just in the process of setting there. So also that night I shot some other images there and uh, this is one of them. This is uh, up in Auriga with, uh, you can see uh, I see uh, 410 and 405 with the tadpoles there. This is the Flaming Star Nebula. This is the Flaming Star itself, A.E. Uh, Auriga. This is an interesting star. Uh, they, we've, we've, we've measured the velocity of this star, its motion, and this is a, a, a runaway star. We think that this was born in the Orion Nebula, but about two million years ago, with, through a gravitational interaction with another star, Mu Geminorum, uh, it actually got ejected from that uh, by, they were doing a mutual gravitational dance and just wound up flinging each other out of, out of the nebula there. So we figured that happened about two million years ago. This is a very bright, hot star, and you, you can see what, what's happening here. It's, uh, it's really illuminating that, uh, that uh, emission nebula there, pumping energy into it. It's a very hot blue star, pumping energy into the gas, which is then subsequently re-emitted re in the uh, red wavelengths. Uh, star forming region here, uh, M10, uh, can't see it at this scale too well there, but this is a home of a couple of pillars like the elephant trunk. These are called the tadpoles, and they're just up there. And then we've got M38 star cluster up in, just in the top corner. So this is, uh, yeah, this is all in, in the constellation of Auriga. Uh, and then uh, also, oops, sorry, there we go, come back. Uh, I added some labels, these are, these are large objects in the sky, I added the moon for scale, uh, so you can see that this covers a, a, a quite a wide path of, in, in the sky. And uh, interestingly enough, I was using, uh, again, uh, you've heard me talk over the last couple of meetings about this uh, Skywatcher uh, star adventurer mount. So, this shot and the next one of, uh, of uh, IC 1396 and Cephas are all unguided shots, which uh, I'm really impressed with this mount. So basically the camera with not a telescope on it, but just a 200 millimeter telephoto lens and uh, exposures ranging from 30 seconds up to two minutes. No auto guiding, no computer driving it, just set it, point it, tell it to, to, to drive and away it goes and it's giving me uh, uh, pretty awesome results, pretty pin pinpoint images uh, with a, a minimal uh, uh, effort, which is rather nice when it starts getting cold. You don't want to start farting around with computers and, 
and cables getting stiff on you there. So it's a, it's a, a very nice mount to, to use. Uh, for those of you that saw the Aurora uh, time lapse that, uh, that I shot uh, and showed uh, last month, this mount is also capable of allowing you to mount your camera pointing horizontally and it'll actually sweep across the sky. So when we had that dramatic Aurora back in October, um, I was using that and it allows you to pan back and forth so it gives your time lapse a sense of motion. So a very versatile little mount. It's only about that big. Very nice for a portability for traveling. I'm going to do a, I'll do a report on it uh, in the new year. I'll put together a presentation just to show you some pictures and, uh, and, uh, and how it works there. And surprisingly inexpensive. The rig costs only about, about $500, which is cheap for a, a mount like that. And it's the type of thing that you can, uh, you can take traveling because it is, it is very, very small. But uh, yeah, the, delivered excellent results. Certainly we had good sky up there that night. It was very dark and uh, it allowed me to, uh, to take these, uh, these objects, objects with a minimum of effort. And uh, the last one I have, that is uh, IC 1396 in Cepheus. Uh, that is the home of the elephant trunk, which you can just see there at that scale. And there's the elephant trunk nebula there. And again, this is a very large object taken with the same uh, instrument. Uh, 200 millimeter telephoto lens. This is actually a, not a, a very long exposure. This in total uh, is, um, I, I stacked a bunch of images there and in total this is only about half an hour's worth of exposure but it really penetrated and got the, uh, got the detail down to the, the smallest stars there and again there's the moon to scale. So a large object in the sky. A number of these objects you can actually see with small telescopes if you're under a dark, dark sky uh, in, including things like the flaming star nebula there. So that's all I have, I think that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you very much. Hey, Chris, can you turn the lights back on? Okay, terrific. Folks, I know the, uh, these metal chairs aren't the most wonderful chairs, so we're, we're going to wrap up real quick. Um, thanks again for the, all the, the observers for sharing your, your wonderful images and videos. We've got RSC calendars for sale in the back uh, against the, uh, the wall. Sayuri is, uh, is selling them at the usual price, uh, one for 16, two for 30. Uh, next slide. Um, thank you all for, uh, the, um, for sharing your um, tonight. Uh, there is a post-meeting social event which is open to everyone. Um, it's at uh, Grace O'Malley's on Ogilvy and uh, Aviation Parkway. It's uh, entirely uh, no, member or no member, you're all welcome. And we will. It's a great, good time. And Brian, yes, I will take you up on the offer of the beer. Sorry for not responding to you. Um, next meeting is uh, Friday, January the 8th, which is the second Friday. We typically have meetings on the first Friday of the month. This one is obviously following the, uh, the, um, the holiday. Okay, you got to put up with two more minutes with, um, uh, with me. Um, I, I wanted to say a, a couple of thank yous. So, so folks, it's, um, it's my final meeting. It's been uh, two, two years. It's, it's come and gone faster than, uh, than I expected, and it's been a, it's, it's been a great ride for me. Um, I'm, I feel really in awe that to be around such talented and such de dedicated people. And um, allow me just to extend my thanks to, uh, just, just to, uh, to, to everyone. First, to our presenters and observers, I think. Without you, we wouldn't have the, the wonderful content that makes these meetings so in, in, in enjoyable. I know you put so many hours and uh, toiling over every presentation, toiling over every image to make it perfect. And um, I, I think uh, together, because of your contribution, uh, we have some awesome meetings that are, that are the envy of the, uh, the RESC. The regular presenters, Dave Chisholm, and before that, Gary uh, Boyle, thank you for your uh, monthly monthly um, segments, uh, of Ottawa Sky segments. I, 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 I like what you've done with this important meeting segment, and I, and, uh, I look forward to seeing it in, in the future, so thank you. Al Scott, well, I can feel, I say with confidence, I think Al is very special. There's, there's, I actually will go so far as to say, I don't think there's anyone quite like Al in the, all of the RASC. For those of you who've been following the thread, on the uh, Rascals uh, Forum, you, you, he's been yeah, a big contributor to the discussion on uh, what came before the Big Bang and the, to the topology of the universe, and he's been holding his own with uh, fielding a ton of questions. Um, I have an image in my head, and I really wish Al were here to hear, hear tonight to hear this, of um, Al uh, working very hard before the meetings, going over his notes, um, and uh, I sense he's somebody who actually knows all the material in his head but he researches it thoroughly so he can deliver something that is, um, that is uh, um, very, you know, that's just, that will make it all so much worthwhile for us. He doesn't have to do this, but he does because he cares, and, and I really appreciate that. 
Uh, Chris Tarrant, Chris, you, uh, um, Chris is a huge part of these meetings. These meetings don't happen because of magic. They happen because Chris toils away at um, AS. He, he, works, he works hard polishing and, and the, the presentation so that it makes sure that everything looks wonderful on the screen. He, 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 worries, um, he worries about the time, and yes, I'm gonna hurry up, Chris, uh, in, the, in these meetings, and he worries that in the back you can see, yeah, that's great. He, he worries in the back that everyone can see the print and, and so forth, um, and when things don't go well in the meetings, there's a extensive post-meeting uh, reviews. So uh, Chris is a big, big part of this meeting. Eric and Eunice, um, the, these are people who, who are, um, they help people, those people who are unable to attend the meetings. And, and it's, because, it's because of their work, recording and streaming the meetings live over the internet, that so many other people who aren't here can en enjoy the meetings. Um, they're constantly, I told you this before, they're constantly making improvements. Uh, they're constantly testing out new technologies. Um, and I encourage you to compare their work to the video recordings that are done by the other centers because you'll see what, that what they offer is the very best in the RASC. And I feel really strong about that. Yes. Art and Ann Fraser, um, every meeting for longer than I can remember, they've come to the meetings uh, lugging a ton of equipment from their, from their car, setting it up, um, offering refreshments, and um, they've been doing this for how many years? Somebody help me. 35 years, okay? So these are, these are very, very special people who deserve our thanks. So in the, second, in, this, in the next part of the meeting, when you're mulling around and looking at the exhibits, help, help yourself to some, um, some refreshments and thank them because these, these people are extraordinary. Last, uh, or second to last, Martha Parkers and, and Sayuri uh, Serrata. These are people who help me with a lot of the odd jobs in the, in the meetings, um, and they, they, they accommodate every um, 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 unimaginable request, you could say. Normal people would push back, um, but these are special people who are committed to ensuring that the meetings run smoothly. And it's the little things that they handle that, that, um, and manage before they become big problems, um, and I'm grateful for that as well, so thank you. And then finally, I'd like to thank you in the audience uh, for, for, for putting up with me for the last uh, two years. I really have strived to, to give the very best program to you, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So thanks, everyone. Thanks. You're very kind. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, that's very kind. So Chris, we can turn the lights on. Folks, we're, we're gonna start with the exhibits uh, now. I wanna say a special thanks to everyone for showing up. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh yes, how could I forget? Um, shame on me. Uh, Roman uh, Zioba. Uh, Roman, are you here? Our next meeting chair. Roman, come on up. I wanna uh, maybe say a few words and, and, and introduce yourself and, um, and I'm delighted that, you, that you're, uh, you're taking the torch. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've got, uh, I've got some pretty big shoes to fill, obviously. I can't remember the last time anyone got a standing ovation uh, here at the RASC. Uh, but I'm going to try to uh, you know, uh, make sure that the uh, meetings go, uh, go ahead as smoothly and as interestingly as, as Mike has made them. Um, he's certainly, I've only been back for a short time, uh, but he certainly made the meetings Know, a, a, a spectacular event. Um, I'll give you, I'll be giving a talk kind of a bit further on in January at the first, uh, at the first meeting that I'll be chair. I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of who I am. Uh, some of you will know, some of you won't. Uh, I've been uh, coming to meetings, my first meeting was in 1998. I became a member in 1999 uh, and I've been a member ever since, although for seven and a half years until J July, uh, sorry, August, I was living in Australia. So I've been a part of the center for a while. I was a council a representative about 10 years ago. Um, and I'm kind of looking forward to really uh, serving the center uh, in this new capacity as, as, as meeting chair. And I just hope I can do as good a job as, uh, as Mike has um, because 
as I said, I've got some really big shoes to fill, and uh, I hope I do. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, so everyone, um, that, that's it. Uh, a special thanks to uh, all, all the uh, exhibitors tonight. Uh, and I want to particularly point out um, uh, Aguilar uh, Rocha and, and then Chris. Uh, they're here from Backyard EOS and uh, Backyard uh, um, Nikon. Spend a bit of time at all the exhibits. Spend a bit, uh, spend a little bit more time at their exhibit. <laughs> I really appreciate their coming. I didn't give them much notice in their hair. Thanks, everyone. Thank you on the internet, folks.